The Donner Party was stuck and would have to last the winter on dwindling supplies. Realizing that their supplies would never last the winter, the caravan sent a group of five men, nine women and one child to attempt to make the summit on foot. Their meager rations ran out on the sixth day, and yet the group continued to brave high winds and freezing weather. One member, Charles Stanton, fell out of the group, utterly exhausted and snowblind, and implored the rest to press on without him. He would never be seen again, either. And soon after, four others would die. With no other choice, the group was forced to cannibalize the dead and press on, carrying strips of frozen human meat in their pouches to munch on as they delved ever deeper into the mountains. Hi everybody, my name is Shauna and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hi everyone, how's it going? In this week's episode, we're going to talk about the expression to bite off more than you can chew. And the fun fact of the day will be the story of the Donner Party, which was a group of American pioneers that traveled by wagon train to California in the 1800s. Some of you probably already know the Donner Party name if you took a class on American history in the past, or the name may have even come up in conversation. The story of the Donner Party is not just one about westward expansion across the United States, but it's also one about survival. Spoiler alert, in order to survive the harsh winter in the Sierra Nevada mountains, the families in the Donner Party resorted to cannibalism. Don't worry though, I'll try and keep this story as PG as possible. In other words, I don't want to go into too much depth about the morbid details. There are plenty of disturbing articles online that you can go ahead and check out if you're interested in this topic um, because it is very well documented. The events that occurred were written in the diaries of the participants, letters, and also from real life accounts from the rescuer teams that came in. So that short audio you heard in the beginning came from a channel on YouTube called The Infographics Show. The video is titled, Why Did Stranded Settlers Do Something So Terrible? The Donner Party. I'll provide the link to that video within the transcript. Let's go ahead and begin with the joke of the day. Today I'm going to do two, and they're probably... Uh, at least from my perspective, probably the two most well-known jokes in English. I've heard them probably, I don't even know, over a hundred times in my entire life. So if you've heard them, then uh, here you go once again. (laughs) So first one, why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine, right? (laughs) Seven, eight, nine, it's as if we're counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. However, eight is also the past tense of eat, meaning that seven, eight, nine, he consumed nine, and that's why six was afraid of seven. All right, funny. Um, number two, did you hear about the seafood diet? All right, you see food and you eat it. <laughs> All right, get it? Okay, um, I think I might be on the seafood diet, not one that consists of shrimp and lobster and crab and things like that. But uh, when I see food, I eat it. <laughs> but in any case, you get the wordplay. Seafood being animals from the ocean or from the sea. And seafood to visualize food or to look at food. Same sound of these two different things, seafood and to see food. Let's talk about the expression of the day, to bite off more than you can chew. And the expression means to take on more tasks or responsibility than is possible to manage. Sometimes when we bite off more than we can chew, the tasks are too difficult, maybe they're too challenging or overwhelming to complete. Maybe we went too far. We overdid ourselves. We spread ourselves too thin. We took on too much. In other words, we bit off more than we could chew. 
Sometimes when I offer help to someone with a big project, right afterwards, I may feel like I bit off more than I can chew because maybe the task is too difficult to complete. I feel overwhelmed and I might not feel like I'm going to be able to complete it all. Let's go through each individual word. Um, So to bite off, well, to bite off means to remove a part with one's teeth. I might bite off a piece of a cookie. So one part of the cookie is in my mouth while the other part remains, I don't know, on the table or on my plate. More, more is a greater amount or number or a higher degree. My childhood neighbor had more cats than anyone else in the neighborhood which is true. She actually had 26 cats. <laughs> Surprising. Um, than. Than is a preposition and conjunction used before the second item in a comparison. For example, I like oranges more than papaya. You is a pronoun used to describe the person to whom we are speaking. You are learning English. Your parents, maybe not. Can is a verb that means to be able to, right? I can do it. You can do it. Chew. Chew means to bite food or other objects consistently with the teeth in order to make them easier to swallow. Something that's hard to chew, we say we gnaw on. Like for example, a dog gnaws on a bone, right? He chews on the bone intensely. Sometimes you might have a friend that chews loudly and we say that they're chomping, right? (laughs) Let's go through some examples of the expression to bite off more than you can chew. So Thanksgiving, as you know, is a very big eating holiday in the U.S. Every fourth Thursday in November, we celebrate Thanksgiving. Although the menu doesn't change every year, there are a ton of different dishes that need to be prepared. For example, stuffing, mashed potatoes and gravy, sweet potatoes, turkey, cranberry sauce, salad, rolls, and then of course, at least three different types of pie for dessert. But I can't tell you how many times I heard people comment on how much work they had to do to prepare for Thanksgiving. I have to go shopping, I have to make 10 different dishes, and I have to clean my house. Why in the world did I offer to do Thanksgiving at my house? right? I bit off more than I can chew. I took on a task that's going to demand much more energy than I can give. Example number two, imagine that you're the head of a chess club and every year there's an annual county tournament that you like to take part in, right? You like to participate in. This year, You told the people who previously ran the tournament, ran this event, that you'd be happy to be in charge. And they tell you, hey, be careful. Don't bite off more than you can chew. In other words, don't overdo yourself. Don't spread yourself too thin. Don't take on more responsibility than you can handle. It may seem easy from the surface, but preparation for the event is incredibly time consuming. Example number three. Imagine that you want to redo your backyard, and when you call a fencer and the landscaper to find out the cost, it turns out you'll need to pay $10,000 for everything you want done, right? A new fence, maybe a new sprinkler system, a new garden, new grass, and you think to yourself, oh, no way. That's way too expensive. I'll do it myself. So you go to the lumber yard and realize that you're going to need to pick up 110 boards to build your fence, lift them, carry them, pay for them. And on your way back home, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I bit off way more than I can chew. I took on too much. I've spread myself too thin. I've overdone myself. I can't do this backyard all by myself. What was I thinking? So can you relate to any of these stories? (laughs) I think we've all bit off more than we could chew at one point in time in our lives. We've taken on more tasks or responsibility than we can handle. But let's go through some listen and repeat exercises to practice your American pronunciation. We'll use the sentence, don't bite off more than you can chew. Repeat after me, don't. Don't bite off. Don't bite off more. 
Don't bite off more than. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't bite off more than you can chew. And the conjugation, I bit off more than I could chew. You bit off more than you could chew. He bit off more than he could chew. She bit off more than she could chew. It bit off more than it could chew. We bit off more than we could chew. They bit off more than they could chew. Let's go ahead and begin with the fact of the day. We're going to be talking about the Donner Party. Just to be clear, when I say party, I mean group. A party can consist of multiple families and people. When you go to a restaurant in the United States, they'll likely ask you how many people are in your party. They mean in your group. So the Donner Party consisted of multiple families. In the 1840s in the U.S., many parties formed to make their way across the United States and to settle on the West Coast. It was a time of westward expansion or manifest destiny, which was the idea that it was America's duty to settle land, right, to inhabit land, particularly to the West. Also, many of the first pioneers were driven by the idea that life was better in California and in Oregon, that the land was fertile and ideal for agricultural purposes. That's what the frontiersmen had written about it. The cherry on top was that they were promised land. The U.S. government at the time said, essentially, if you move west, you can take what land you want for free. So many dreamed of having their own homesteads, right, a house with a farm and fertile land surrounding it. So in April 1846, on the promise of a better future, a lot of pioneers left from Independence, Missouri, and began taking the Oregon Trail, the trail that pretty much all pioneers at that time took to come to the West. The Donner family, the Reed family, and many others planned to do the same. So they created a wagon train, which is a single file line of covered wagons that travel together, one family after the other, so that they could have a sense of security. Imagine if a wooden wheel broke, they could get assistance from another wagon or from another group of people. So each covered wagon consisted of wooden wheels, a light canvas cover to shade from the sun, and was pulled by oxen. According to Tamsin Donner, they brought cows with them as well that they could milk. They could also make butter out of that milk. The journey from Missouri to California was meant to take from four to six months and would require full wagons of provisions. Provisions are the supply of food and drink needed to complete a long journey. So this group set off. When on the trail, though, a man named Lansford Hastings convinced the group that they could take a shortcut and arrive much sooner, right? He proposed a new route. The trail split at Laramie, Wyoming. The majority decided to continue on the northern trail, right, along the Oregon Trail that had been tried and tested. And the other part of the group, the minority, would travel Hastings' route through the dried-up Great Salt Lake Desert in Utah, through Nevada, through the Sierra Nevadas, and then, of course, arrive in California, right? That group that split off, that minority, would be called the Donner Party because George Donner was in charge. What they didn't know is that Hastings had never actually tried the trail himself. He didn't know what to expect along the trail. He had never seen it. In the back of his mind, 
he thought that he would be able to get more business in his shops if he created a trail that would run into them. So right from the very beginning, it seemed like they had bitten off more than they could chew. The terrain was much rougher than Hastings had described. Some of it was covered in trees and needed to be cut back, and rivers that were very rapid and rough on their wagons and oxen. Sometimes there were even cliffs where their wagons almost fell. At times they needed to move boulders out of the way in order to continue on their way. Right, and boulders are giant rocks. Also, to top it off, at the very beginning of the trip, the mother of the Reed family died of tuberculosis. Right, a few days after hitting the Great Salt Lake Desert, the water supply had run dry. The majority of the oxen escaped to look for water, and most of them did not return. So, horses disappeared, the cattle somehow as well. It had taken a lot longer to cross than anticipated, and everyone was parched. Everyone was thirsty. So a few days were spent looking for the animals that had disappeared and figuring out how to deal with the lack of food and water. After passing another 40 kilometers of desert, the group learned what the shortcut had cost them. Resources, food and water, and time. The trip had already taken them a month longer than planned. Many were furious at Hastings, but what could they do, right? They had come so far and it didn't make sense to go back. The animals that were recaptured were so weak that many of the travelers were told to walk. Some who couldn't walk were left to die. So at last, they reached the Sierra Nevada, this beautiful mountain range that divides California from Nevada. And they were told that after making it across, they would reach their destination, but they needed to be quick. The first snowfall was expected in November, and it was already late October. They knew that they needed to cross the Sierra Nevada before the snowy season came, not just for their own well-being, but for their animals. Their animals were tired and weak, and they needed green grass and fields to survive. But the first snow came, came early November when it was expected mid-November. So two weeks earlier than expected, and they couldn't make it over the mountain pass. So the group split up and set up camp near a lake, or later called Donner Lake, near Truckee. So tents were set up, shelters were built out of whatever material they could find. All they wanted and needed to do was to make it over that mountain pass. On good days, some of the pioneers tried to venture over, but would come back when realizing that the snow was too deep or that no visible trail could be seen. The weather conditions were so bad, many thought they'd need to wait out the entire winter. In California, the winter can last from, I mean, apparently there, November until who knows, late March. At that point in time, there were 60 travelers at Truckee Lake and half of them children, right? About 29 of them. The Donner family, along with a few other families, were about half a day down the mountain, right behind this first group. They had been set back because a wheel on one of the wagons had to be fixed. About 20-something were down there. The food situation was bad before the snow, but the weather made finding game, meat, or anything to eat virtually impossible. One man named Eddie was able to shoot a bear, but that was about it. All of the other food sources were gone, right? They depleted them. To avoid starvation, the pioneers ate all of the oxen that had made it that far. When the oxen were gone, they began eating the hide. Right? Hide is a synonym for animal skin. So they ate the oxen hide. They boiled it down until it was, quote, a jelly-like consistency. The rest of this story originates from written accounts of the survivors and diaries of those who passed away. McGlashan, the author of In History of the Donner Party, A Tragedy of the Sierra Nevada, stated that the children then began eating a rug that was in front of the fireplace. From the reed cabin, the same was happening, and they began eating their roof, which was also made of ox hide. 
For many, the situation couldn't get much worse, and they had to do something. So a band was formed called the Snowshoe Party, and they went out to get help. The name came from the fact that the group built somewhat successful snowshoes from some of the material that they had. The individuals in the group were determined to get help no matter what the stakes were. They made it over the pass. However, the snow blowing in their faces affected the sight of many. Some even went blind. Others had very little to no energy to continue just because there was a lack of food. Right, Days passed without food. At one point in time, one of the individuals, Patrick Dolan, suggested a human sacrifice to provide food. He thought someone should volunteer. Others thought there should be a duel. Some thought there should be a lottery. But no such thing ended up happening. In the harsh weather conditions, some members of the group passed away naturally, and the food problem was momentarily solved. Right, Cannibalism happened. More days passed, And then a few other men were killed to provide food for the others, right, for their survival. Those who were not eaten, right, some of these these survivors made it down the mountain for help. Although help was not easy to come by, right, (laughs) many of the men who would normally have joined a rescue group were off fighting the Mexican-American War. Some sources say that they were able to raise funds for a rescue group only when news spread about cannibalism among families up there. So people sympathized, and equivalent to about $35,000 nowadays was raised. From February to April, relief or rescue parties came back for the families who were still hiding out in these cabins and tents near Donner Lake. The last group to be discovered was the Donner family and those at the lower campsite. When the rescue party arrived, they were shocked to see the state of the survivors. Many were emaciated. When someone is emaciated, it means that they are past skinny, to the point where you can see bones under their skin. Some of the survivors suffered from frostbite, right? injury to skin tissue that usually occurs in extremely cold weather. For example, if you don't wear gloves in the snow, you might get frostbite. Others had gangrene, which is death of a specific tissue due to lack of blood circulation or maybe the introduction of some sort of bacteria. Some had passed away and were buried. However, to their dismay, there were some very blatant instances of cannibalism. One rescue party accounts seeing one of the survivors walking through the woods with a leg and then throwing it into a pit where other pieces of Jacob Donner could be found. Three bodies were also discovered that had been consumed. There are many other stories that are very detailed in some of the letters written by the survivors and the rescuers who came across this um, that I actually prefer to leave out so that you don't lose sleep at night tonight, but you can check those out on the internet if you are somehow interested. So let's just leave it at that. Of the 87 people in the Donner Party, this small group that decided to take Hastings shortcut, 48 survived. Many who survived went on living their lives. Some tried to punish others for apparently killing their family members for food. Others suffered from criticism by the public who were informed about these cannibalistic acts. So that's the end of the Donner Party story. It's an unbelievable story of survival and also one that can be hard to discuss in detail because cannibalism is taboo. I'm happy to say that I've never been in a life or death situation that made me question my survival tactics, and I hope that you haven't either. At the end of the day, the story gives some insight, though, into the hardships that early pioneers went through to make it west. It's also a starting off point for you to think about survival. What would you do to stay alive? This weekend, I'm going up to a wedding in Reno, and we'll pass Truckee and Donner Lake along the way. My family and I are planning on going to Donner State Memorial Park, which is where this story of the Donner Party took place. 
I can almost promise you it won't be snowy since it's still summer here, at least until September 21st, I think, or September 23rd. So it will not be like it was described in the story, but if you would like to see pictures of the location, um, I'll post some on my Instagram account at American English Podcast. So you can check that out if you're interested. Also, if you'd like bonus content for this episode, which includes a video explanation of me explaining the challenging vocabulary and phrases, a listening comprehension quiz, a vocabulary quiz, and a shadowing exercise to improve your pronunciation, make sure to visit AmericanEnglishPodcast.com slash the classroom to get more details about that. Hope you enjoyed and until next time. Bye.